What's going on guys? The Comics Kid 2099 here to talk to you about The Chronicles of Corum. Uh, these are three uh, graphic novels adapting uh, some novels uh, by the sci-fi fantasy author Michael Moorcock. Uh, volume 1, uh, The Knight of Swords. Uh, volume 2, The Queen of Swords. And Volume 3, The King of Swords. Uh, volumes 1 and 2 are uh, written by uh, Mike Baron uh, with penciling by uh, Mike Mignola uh, and inking by uh, Rich uh, Rick Burchett, uh, Kelly Jones, uh, Carrie Spiegel, and uh, Ripley Thornhill. Uh, and then in Volume 2, I want to say it's some of the same names. Uh, yeah, same names uh, in Jackson Geis. Uh, and then uh, Volume 3 uh, has a little bit of a different creative team. Uh, Mike Baron uh, wrote the first issue for Volume 3, and then following that, uh, it was uh, written or adapted by uh, Mark Stainblum, uh, with art by Ken Hooper, uh, Jill Thompson, and Kelly Jones. So a whole lot of names in there that you probably recognize, and uh, most of these are people who, uh, this was before they really became big names in the industry. Uh, this is before Mike Mignola created Hellboy. Uh, this is before Kelly Jones. Uh, I feel like before he became really well known uh, doing uh, Batman covers in the 90s, uh, and he did that uh, Batman Vampire trilogy. Uh, this is before that. Uh, Jill Thompson, I know her work. Uh, she did a little bit of art on uh, The Sandman, uh, and this is before that. Uh, I don't know if she was uh, known for something else before that or not, but uh, a whole lot of names here uh, that uh, I feel like it's interesting getting to see them pretty early in their career. Uh, uh, for example, Mike Mignola, uh, in these first two volumes, uh, it scarcely looks like the Mignola that you will see uh, in the 90s and 2000s. Uh, he really loves using a lot of shadow in his artwork, and there's not a whole lot of that in these uh, stories. Uh, it's very bright and colorful, what you're seeing here. And uh, there's an interview in one of these books where Mignola even says he scarcely recognizes the artist that did these stories. He says he can't really see M uh, Mike Mignola uh, in these stories. And uh, that's interesting. Uh, but there are times where I'm like, hey, that kind of looks like something that you would have seen in Hellboy. Uh, like a giant god uh, wading through the ocean with a net. That looks like something you would see in a Hellboy story of some kind. And so, uh, and Mignola even said he subconsciously based uh, Hellboy off of the character of Corum, uh, who uh, has a weird hand like Hellboy. And then uh, later on, spoilers for Hellboy, uh, Hellboy loses his eye, uh, he says in this interview. And Corum also loses his eye. And so uh, Mignola said it was kind of interesting that he uh, uh, his career gravitated towards uh, this character. Uh, and I guess before I talk a little bit about these books, I should talk about my experiences with Michael Moorcock. Uh, the first thing I read from Moorcock was this book about Elric of uh, Melden Bonet, uh, I think is how it's pronounced. And uh, if you're a Game of Thrones fan, uh, Brendan Rivers in the backstory of Game of Thrones is loosely based on uh, Elric. Uh, but uh, this was a series of short stories published in magazines in the 60s and then a couple of uh, shorter novellas also and this is not all of the Elric stuff but uh, without spoilers there is a certain sense of completion uh, with this book so I haven't read anything with Elric uh, past this volume but I read this and then uh, I read a book called City of the Beast which was a human man who is transported to Mars and fights aliens and it felt very much like Michael Moorcock doing Edgar Rice Burroughs and and so I didn't really care for that book as much. It didn't feel as uh, edgy and inventive as uh, what he was doing with Elric. I really felt like Elric, he was turning the fantasy genre on its head a little bit, uh, doing stuff that uh, really hadn't been done a whole lot with fantasy, uh, or at least sword and sorcery fantasy up until that point. Uh, but that was about all that I had read from Michael Moorcock. Uh, and so uh, I've never read the core of books that these comics are based on. Uh, but really Reading through these books, uh, I was starting to say, this feels very familiar. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of similarities with what he was doing with Elric. Because one thing Michael Moorcock does, uh, it's kind of similar to what Stephen King uh, was doing with the Dark Tower books that he wrote, uh, where uh, there's this larger war of good versus evil that connects everything that the author wrote. Uh, Stephen King, uh, you've got connections to Salem's Lot and It uh, and Insomnia. All of that connects to uh, the Seven Dark Tower books, and there are further connections. Uh, you got the character Randall Flagg from The Stand. Uh, he is a character in The Dark Tower, and so 
Stephen King kind of has this larger cosmology uh, that's connected through one series of his works. And Michael Moorcock was doing something very similar uh, back in the 60s, although it's more of a sword and sorcery angle uh, than what Stephen King was doing. Uh, because you have uh, different characters who exist in different times and different worlds, but they are all the same facet of one single character. Uh, the Eternal Champion, who is this character who is fighting in the war between law and chaos. Uh, and uh, sometimes it's a character in the future, sometimes it's a character in the distant past on an ancient world that doesn't exist. Uh, Elric, uh, Corum, uh, Hawkmoon, uh, Erikos, uh, all of these characters are facets of the Eternal Champion. Uh, and in these books, there's also uh, a character who shows up. His name is uh, Jerry Aconel, uh, or a Aconel, uh, I don't know how it's pronounced, but it's J-H-A-R-R-Y. And it took me longer than I would care to admit to read Realize, oh, that is Michael Moorcock being a little cutesy uh, because there is a character named Jerry Cornelius uh, who uh, I have not read anything from Jerry Cornelius. The extent of my knowledge with him is he appears in the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen books, but uh, Jerry Cornelius is another facet of the Eternal Champion, uh, which is weird when you read these comics because Jerry here, he says he is not a hero. He is a companion to heroes, and he is always a companion to heroes, and he knows about the Eternal Champion. He he knows who Elric is and who Erikos is, but Corum has no idea who these guys are at first. Uh, but Jerry, uh, he seems to think that he is only a companion, but then eventually he will become Jerry Cornelius. I'm 99% sure those names are way too similar uh, to be coincidental. Uh, and Jerry Cornelius, I think, is also a facet of the Eternal Champion. So uh, interesting that here the character of Jerry says he's just a sidekick and nothing more. Uh, a guide also, but a sidekick basically. Uh, but then later on he will become a hero in his own right. Uh, so uh, that is about all that I know about Michael Moorcock going into these books, but uh, I uh, really enjoyed these, at least uh, the first two. Uh, basically, uh, you have this character, you, you've got these two different races, and I am not going to attempt to pronounce these names. Uh, on like page one of volume one, it throws a whole bunch of weird lingo at you, uh, words that you cannot possibly pronounce. It took a few pages for me to kind of get in the mindset uh, to read these books. But basically, uh, you have men who are a new race. And then you've got these two other races, and I'm just going to say they are elves and trolls. Because later on in Volume 3, Corum meets a woman from another time and place who she says, you guys are basically like elves, and then these other creatures are basically like trolls. And uh, these races have been at war with each other for, like, bazillions of years. And the war is slowly starting to go out of memory. And then this new race called men, they come in and they want to slaughter uh, these ancient races that have been on this planet uh, for so long. And then Corum is basically the last of his race. And then uh, he is on a quest of revenge and then that quest kind of uh, molds and shapes itself into uh, something different. He gets roped into this uh, giant war uh, between law and chaos. And uh, that's really the basic plot of these books. Uh, and with the first two it's pretty straightforward. Uh, you have a character who has a goal. Uh, they, they say, like, okay, here's this thing that we need to get so that we can uh, stop this one particular law of, uh, Lord of Chaos from doing this thing, and then they go and do that. Uh, starting in Volume 3, I felt like it became a little too uh, complicated, and uh, part of this may be uh, the fault of Michael Moorcock, and part of it may be that it was really clear in the books what was going on, and then something is lost in translation when it's uh, taken into comic book form. Uh, I have no idea how long the Quorum books are, uh, but each of these are only uh, four issues long, a little over 100 pages apiece. And so if you take a 200-page book and try to condense that into a 100-page comic book, you are going to lose something. And there were times reading these books where I did feel like I was losing something. In the first book, uh, Quorum, uh, he meets this human woman, uh, and then like in the span of a page and a half, uh, they're in bed together. He wakes up and she's laying right next to him. And then like the next page over, Coram says something like, uh, did your husband leave anything here that will help us? And I was like, husband? And I go back and look and sure enough, it had not mentioned that she had a husband. And I feel like that's something that probably would have come up if you were reading the book. 
Uh, and part of that was also uh, the book trying to throw a lot of weird lingo towards you, like uh, she is part of the race of man, but she is also called, uh, called the uh, Marvogian or something like that, the Mar Marvogian or something. Uh, and so it keeps throwing words like that at you, and I'm trying to process that, and then I have to go back and look, and no, it didn't mention that she had a husband. And suddenly Coram says, hey, what about your husband? Did he have anything here? Uh, and uh, there's stuff like that that I feel like this story would probably work a little better if you're reading the original where uh, you're getting more stuff. Uh, I think you are probably losing a little bit of something uh, taking this story and turning it into a comic book. Uh, but by the time you get to wherever it is, Volume 3, uh, I feel like it's... Uh, it had to have been a much bigger and more grand story than the previous two. I am almost certain that uh, the book that Volume 3 is based on was longer than the stories that Volumes 1 and 2 are based on, because it feels like it is just rushing through uh, this story uh, to get it all condensed into 110 pages. Uh, in Volume 3, Coram actually meets Elric and Erikos, and uh, if you are a fan of uh, The Eternal Champion and stories by Michael Moorcock, you might say, all right, yeah, I want to see all these guys team up. And unfortunately, it doesn't really amount to much. Uh, Elric's companions that you have spent all this time with in Volumes 1 and 2, uh, he is separated from them in Volume 3, and then he meets up with Elric and Erikos, and then they do a little sword fighting uh, with some bad guys, and then they all go their separate ways. And I'm like, oh, okay, that was a little disappointing. And uh, it reminded me of a friend of mine, uh, years ago, he borrowed my uh, Angel DVDs, uh, and uh, I uh, told him one of my favorite seasons of Angel was Season 5. Uh, I really liked the premise of Angel being in charge of Wolfram and Hart. Uh, I thought that was uh, a significant improvement over the last couple of seasons, uh, the last previous seasons of Angel. And he said he didn't like Season 5, and I asked him why. And he said uh, that Spike was way too prevalent in that season. There were several episodes that were central on Spike, and he didn't watch Buffy. He only watched Angel. And so suddenly, this character he didn't care about shows up in Season 5, and becomes a major character that several episodes focuses on and uh, he didn't like that and I was like okay yeah that makes sense and so if you are just reading Corum, and then suddenly uh, you have Elric of Elnabone, Elric of Melnabone and uh, Ericos show up, and then they don't really do that much. It's basically just here as a fan servicey nod to the other uh, Eternal Champion stories that you might be familiar with. But if you're not familiar with those, then this is going to feel like a big waste of space. And Rowena, who is a pretty important character in the previous two volumes, she's barely in Volume Three. And Jerry o uh, Jerry of Canel, uh, he is in Volume Three a little bit more than. Rowena. Lena, but not as much as he was in Volumes 1 and 2. And so, uh, I feel like Volume 3 maybe should have been longer, or maybe it should have spent less time on this team-up between Elric and Coram and El El uh, Ericos. Uh, should have spent less time on the team-up with those guys, and should have spent more time with these characters that we had spent all this time with. Uh, but overall, uh, I like this. It did remind me a lot of what I had read uh, with Elric before, uh, but that's to be expected, because uh, Elric and Coram uh, and Hawk Moon, all those characters, they're all part of the same story uh, that Michael Moorcock is telling. Uh, so uh, I thought this was pretty good. Having never read the original Quorum stories, I would say that uh, everyone involved did a pretty decent job adapting these stories to comics. Uh, there were a few times where I was kind of fumbling with what was going on, and I'm not sure if that was because the original story wasn't especially clear with what was going on, or if the people adapting it uh, weren't doing a good enough job bringing it to comics. But overall, uh, I like these books, uh, so if you have the chance to read them, uh, I would recommend that you do so. Uh, that's all I have today. In the meantime, you guys have a great rest of your day. Catch you later.